Hi, Pastor Bob here. Today I'm taking up the sermon in Acts chapter 2 where Peter came down to the upper room with the others speaking with other tongues. The purpose of tongues, why did God give it? To arrest the tension of the people so they could receive Jesus as Savior. It has not changed at all today. Let's go to the Word of God and let's be blessed together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome again to Student of the Word. Glad you're here. We began a, a series of sermons we're going to be teaching over the next numbers of week yesterday. We're taking Peter's sermon in Acts chapter two, the kickoff of the church age and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and his sermon right after the uh, multitudes of Jews from every nation under heaven heard the speaking in tongues of these illiterate people coming down from the upper room. We hear them speak in our own tongues and they knew they were Galileans and Galileans were typically uneducated. And they heard them speaking fluently, not only the languages of where these men came from, but they heard the actual dialects of the area they were from. And so they were amazed. And so again, they said uh, here in chapter two of the book of Acts, they said, we hear them and all the nations, they said, we hear them speak in our own tongue or glossa, which is language, is the wonderful works of God. And so we just laid some things out, and so we'll be getting more into that today. And uh, this will probably go through this week, probably even into a couple more weeks as we take up three separate different sermons. And so the next will be in chapter six, where Stephen preached his sermon in Acts chapter 6 and finally the Apostle Paul in chapter 17 as he was on Mars Hill preaching there. So three individuals, these are the three full sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts. We know it's going to be a great, great blessing to you. So this speaking in tongues again that was found in, in verse 11 here was not the preaching of the gospel. No, in fact, there's people that say that today that speaking with tongues was given originally on the day of Pentecost for preaching the gospel. Listen, that is not true. They said we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 17 said that when you speak with tongues, you give thanks well. It's praise and worship to God and adoration to Him. Again, it's more personal. This is the language they were speaking in. And even if you have the gift of tongues where you give a tongue to be interpreted, it's not the Word of God. It is not leading people to accept Jesus as Savior. It grabs people's attention. It is a sign and a wonder. And this is the purpose of signs and wonders. Healing was never gave to preach the gospel. No, healing was designed to grab their attention, show them something in the natural they could not do, get rid of a sickness or disease, and make them aware. And because he, that Jesus did this, or the multitudes even were healed in the book of Acts, it grabbed their attention so they would listen to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Again, signs and wonders were to grab the people and show them that the supernatural things they were doing now can also be accompanied by receiving Jesus as Savior. So this is what, again, speaking with tongues was on the day of Pentecost. No one on the day of Pentecost got saved until Peter quit speaking with tongues and preached the gospel in a known language. That's always been what it's for. So again, we're glad that you're here today. We're teaching out of my book on the book of Acts, and we're talking about this sermon that came right after the people were filled with the Holy Spirit introducing the church age. And remember something again, when Jesus left this earth, he was the only Jesus and he was crucified, you know, stayed with them for 40 days and ascended into heaven. And then Jesus was gone. But on the day of Pentecost, 120 little Jesuses came down, not the same as, the, as Jesus himself, but were the ones that were standing in his place. And just as Jesus came, now we stand in his place. We minister the word of God. We minister the same way he did with the same message that he had. And so he went to heaven and these, and suddenly instead of one Jesus on the day of Pentecost, 120 Jesuses came walking down from the upper room. By the end of the day, 3,120 Jesuses were going to occur. Later on, a few days later, 8,120 Jesuses as it kept multiplying and multiplying. And Satan, instead of having one Jesus, now has thousands of them. Demons are running everywhere trying to stop all this stuff. And each one has been anointed, not only to 
preach the gospel, but also operated the same signs, wonders, miracles, raising of the dead. And this occurred through the book of Acts. All these things were given to them as again to operate in them, to grab the people's attention and bring many to the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the book of Acts is what my book of Acts uh, from the book of Acts will be offered at halftime when the announcer comes to tell you all about it. So again, remember, no one on this day, the day of Pentecost, received Jesus as their Savior until Peter quit speaking with tongues, preached the gospel in a language they could all understand, which was Greek. And the purpose of speaking with tongues was to edify and build up the ones who were filled and grab the attention of those who were listening so they would listen to the gospel. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Let's take a look at verse 12. So they're all amazed. That Greek word means shocked here in chapter two of Acts, they were all amazed or shocked and perplexed, saying one to another, what could this mean? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. I like that word for wine there in that particular verse of scripture, it's the word glucose. And glucose is where we get the word glucose, which is for sugar, sweetness. And there, it's, it's a type of wine that was not very, uh, it could not get you that drunk, but it made you just feel good. And it was, it was very sweet, very sugary. And so new wine was sweet. Sweet wine, it took a lot to make a person drunk. The drunkenness was not great intoxication, but a looseness and a joy. These men in the street did not think they were drunk because they were falling down or having difficulty walking. No, they were speaking in tongues, and this is what they said. On top of that, it's very early in the day, and Peter's going to bring this out. In verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, You men of Judah, those are visitors, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, their hometown people. Let this be known to you and take heed to my words. The preaching of the gospel began after Peter quit speaking with tongues and now preaches the language of the people I can understand. Tongues was not given to preach the gospel. I want to say that again. It never was. It never was used in Acts. It never was used in any other time to preach the gospel. Again, tongues was not given to preach the gospel, but to grab the attention of the unbeliever, magnify God, edify the one praying or speaking with tongues. After getting the people's attention, Peter now preaches the gospel to them. And he says in verse 15, these are not drunk as you suppose. Seeing it's only the third hour of the day, that's nine o'clock in the morning. Not too many people people, unless you're totally alcoholics, are drunk by nine o'clock in the morning. Peter tells them the men and women are not drunk as they think of drunkenness. Their speaking with tongues was taken by the religious men and a case was made for indignation against the work of the Holy Spirit. To say these people were drunk would put a mockery and a derision against the credibility of the people who were obviously under the control of something supernatural. So Peter reminds them that this is only nine o'clock in the morning and be more difficult for a large group to be drunk at this early hour. He says in verse 16, no, this is scriptural. This was already prophesied in the Old Testament, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter quotes Joel chapter two, verses 28 and 29. Peter turns their eyes to something they're familiar with, the Old Testament prophets. Although Joel was not specifically prophesying about the day of Pentecost, the coming of the church age, his prophecy is used by Peter to tell of a parallel outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that there will be at the second advent or the second coming of Jesus to establish his millennial reign of which they know all about. The Old Testament spoke so uh, often and so uniquely and so proficiently about the coming of Jesus Christ at his coming to establish his kingdom on this earth. And this is the dual kingdom we're talking about here. The church, which is a preview of the millennium. The church is not the millennium, but the blessings on the church far exceeded the blessings of the Old Testament and somehow, and in some cases, parallel the millennium. So what happens when the millennium begins with a great outpouring of the Spirit, so does the church age. The church age is not the millennium, understand that, but one is being used as a comparison to the other. There's a former and a latter rain spoken of also by Joel before he brings out this prophecy of the millennium in Joel chapter two and verse 23. The former rain was given at Pentecost 
Pentecost and the latter rain will occur at the beginning of the millennium. Verse 17 of Acts chapter two, it shall come to pass in the last days, he's quoting now the book of Joel, it will come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. This is unique because the Holy Spirit was only given to prophets, priests, and kings of the Old Testament and not to women. But here he says, your daughters and your sons will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. You know what he's saying now? You don't have to stand in a particular office to get this. As soon as you're born again, this can be given to you. Your sons can receive Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Your daughters can receive Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit. They can begin to prophesy. Why? But they're not prophets. But chapter 14 of Acts says you can all prophesy. At one time or another, anybody can prophesy. You just trust God and begin to give what the Holy Spirit gives to you. But that still doesn't mean you stand in the office of a prophet because simple prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And the Holy Spirit can give you something to give to somebody else. And you might think that was a nice thought. No, it came from the Holy Spirit. You know it did. You weren't thinking about that. In essence, that is a form of prophecy. And your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men, you'll see visions. Wow, this is something. Again, in the Old Testament, visions were there, dreams were there, but it was only again for prophets or those at a specific time of great importance. But just to have young men, and old men and daughters and sons operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit was unique. The last days here in this verse of scripture given in the two Testament is the time period of Jesus absence from the earth or the church age, Hebrews chapter one and verse two. The last days began at Pentecost and will continue until the rapture of the church and for the duration of the tribulation, the church age is God's spiritual preview of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. In the church age, Jesus rules over his body, which is the church. In the millennium, he'll rule over the entire earth for 1,000 years from his place in the temple in Jerusalem. This is why many scriptures dealing with the millennium have a double meaning in the New Testament, speaking of the church age, but also speaking of the outpouring of the spirit at the time that Jesus Christ comes back to rule and to reign. So this outpouring of the spirit is for all believers, male and female, young and old. In Galatians chapter three and verse 28, it brings out that when the spirit comes, there's no sexual, no age distinctions in the body of Christ. Part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit for the church age is supernatural guidance. No more is the Spirit's guidance uh, confined only to the inward voice or now dreams and visions as they were in the Old Testament. Now it's for everyone who trusts in the Lord, receives Him as Savior, old or young, male or female. In the Old Testament, this type of guidance was given to those who held high spiritual offices. Now it's available to all who are saved and then become filled with the Holy Spirit. All these things are wonderful. Next verse 18, on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Who are the men servants? The guys that mow your lawn, the maid servants, those who come and clean up your house. He's simply saying everybody is subject to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit if they receive Jesus as Savior. What a time we live in. I'll see you right after the break. At the dawn of the church age, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and power to his followers. From Pentecost, they were led by His Spirit to blaze a trail through the hazardous maze of pagan cultures and religious legalism. Like wildfire, the gospel spread through the known world, bringing salvation to a whole generation and triumph and trial to the church. In a New Testament commentary on Acts, Bob Yannian explores the exploits of those sent to uproot the binding vines of religion and philosophy and to sow the kingdom of God. Through evaluations of early congregations and detailed descriptions of their cities, Pastor Bob walks us through the exciting, perilous adventure of the early church. Order a New Testament commentary on Acts at bobyendian.com. A good Bible commentary is an invaluable resource for learning and understanding the doctrines of Jesus, the interrelations of the different books, and your place in the body of Christ. Assembled from Pastor Bob Yandian's personal study notes, this nine-book set of New Testament commentaries represents a lifetime of scriptural study, pastoral insight, and spiritual wisdom. 
These commentaries are a rich study source for pastors, ministers, believers, and students of the Word. Included are one of each commentaries on the Book of Acts, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, James, Hebrews, and the Epistles of John. Order your New Testament Commentary Books bundle at bobbyindian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. I do want you to have a copy of my book on the book of Acts. Acts is kind of like just the, the chronology of all the great things that happened in Rome and other places. So when Paul is writing in the book of Romans, you can understand where the church came from. Philippi, you can understand where the church came from. All these things are laid out in the book of Acts. More probably history is given in the book of Acts of what's going to happen. But like I said, three specific sermons we're dealing with the first one here by Peter on the day of Pentecost at the outpouring of the Holy Holy Spirit, that which really kicked off the church age as something unique, something that had never existed before, a time period where God poured out more of His Spirit on everybody that's born again, not just specific prophets, priests, and kings. We left off, let's take a look at verse 18 here in Acts chapter 2, speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on my men servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out of my Spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. What he's saying here is not only is for men and women, not only is for young and old, but here he's simply saying, and if this is for classes of people, it's for the low class, the upper class, middle class. God doesn't see any difference between us. God doesn't care when you come to church, if you sit beside the president of a bank and on the other side, you have a guy that has a, you know, trash collecting business. He doesn't see that. We do. We classify people that way. And we see one is important, not important. And James really got upset with his ushers in the book of James when he says, you seat the rich people up front and you put the poor people in the back. Now, why are you doing that? He says, don't make any distinction. God loves them all. And so he says again on my men's servants, that's the guys that mow your lawn. My, the maid servants, that's the women that come and clean up your house. I'll pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Oh, the Jews were probably so upset by this because they put classes of people and here the Holy Spirit isn't classifying people at all. They're simply a person who's received Jesus as Lord and Savior, a part of the body of Christ and a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, servants and handmaids speak of sexual and social distinctions. We have it, God does it. The Holy Spirit not only cares for men and women, but makes no distinction at all of rich or poor, upper or lower class. Prophecy does not mean that everyone will operate as a prophet, but it does mean at certain times all will receive spiritual revelations and be able to utter words of edification and prophecy to other believers. This is found in 1 Corinthians 14. Philip had four daughters. The Bible didn't say they were prophetesses. It didn't say they were prophets. It just said they did prophesy in Acts chapter 21 and verse 9 and were instrumental in guiding Paul in the right direction all though he didn't listen to them. They stood there and then later on words even came from Agabus, a known prophet. But again, they were just four daughters that prophesy. And here we have this recorded here in this verse of scripture. Now, they, the four daughters that prophesied were in Acts 21 and verse 9. But here in Acts 2, it simply says this is a gift that people can operate in by, again, prophecy because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, in the church service, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 31, all may prophesy. So again, it's not just for the prophet, but the simple gift of prophecy is for everybody, but unique prophecy, guiding, leading, and directing people into exactly the will of God is for the prophet himself. Acts 19, I'll show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. And again, here we are comparing the day of the Holy Spirit's outpouring to a time period to come when, when Jesus will come and rule and reign over the entire earth, which is the millennial reign. During the church age, God will begin to show signs and wonders in the earth called birth pangs. 
These are individual things like earthquakes, hurricanes, things like that, that are leading us into the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these things we see happening around us, I mean, more and more about earthquakes, more and more about tsunamis in the earth. This is not a time to get upset and go, oh my goodness, what's going on around us? This is like a mother who can feel the child again, and every birth pang indicates it's closer to the coming of the birth of that child. We ought to rejoice as a mother does. Oh, one more birth pang closer. Everything that happens in this earth with increasing intensity getting close together, earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, wars, these are all indicators. The birth is about to come and the birth is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We're not closer to the tribulation as far as I say. Yes, we are, but that's not what I'm looking for. Even the tribulation is a great birth pang indicating the coming of Jesus Christ to rule the earth. The birth pangs do not stop at the rapture of the church, but continue to increase intensity during the tribulation. The blood, fire, vapor, of smoke is the final birth pangs, the battle of Armageddon. Shortly after this battle, Jesus will take his throne in Jerusalem, in the temple in Jerusalem, and then he's going to reign for 1,000 years. Verse 20 here in Acts 2, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. In Joel 2, these events will occur afterwards, Joel 2.28. All of these occurrences come after the church age ends and will precede the second coming of the Lord, Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. And he's going to come back and rule and reign over the earth. All of these events are designed for one thing, to cause the inhabitants of the earth to see the awesome anger, wrath, and power of the Lord against unbelief and unrighteousness. This event, the coming of the Lord Jesus to reign on earth, will cause many to fall on their knees and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Yet many will also harden their hearts even more and rebel against the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad I've accepted Jesus, aren't you? We'll never see those days because the rapture is going to take us up to heaven. And then the outpouring of God's wrath is going to come on the earth. At the same time, the outpouring of Satan's wrath is going to take place on the earth. And much like when Pharaoh withstood God, Pharaoh withstood him, God withstood him. Then Pharaoh withstood him, then God withstood him. And finally, in the end, Pharaoh did all he could and his men around him, his magicians did all they could and they couldn't do anything more. And and God just kept increasing and increasing and increasing until Pharaoh and his armies were destroyed in the Red Sea. I'm simply here to tell you another Red Sea event's going to come called the Battle of Armageddon, of which Satan stands up against God. God stands up against Satan. Satan stands even harder against God. God even comes harder against Satan. And finally, Satan does all he can. And God just keeps on doing more and more till great destruction comes to the kingdom of Satan. Satan will be thrown off the earth. Unbelievers will be thrown off the earth. The false prophet will be cast off the earth. And uh, all of Satan's power, all of Satan's people, the sinners all, again, demons and, and antichrist will all be thrown off the earth into hell for 1,000 years. And at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, Satan will be released one more time to prove to the world he will not change. He still tries to overthrow God. And this time, he, his cohorts, and all unbelievers will stand before the great white throne judgment and sentence from there to the lake of fire forever and forever. I'm on the winning side. You're on the winning side. And again, Verse 21 says, and it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're still living in a time when people can call on the name of the Lord. And that's why we have been left here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Peter uses this verse from Joel 2 to begin his salvation sermon from the day of wrath coming on the earth. These Jews who are listening to this sermon will not face that day, but they will face the great white throne judgment of the Lord Jesus if they do not accept Jesus as their savior during their earthly life. So Peter's Pentecost sermon begins in verse 22. And Peter now speaking to those that were out there after hearing all of this speaking with tongues and hearing it in their own dialects are shocked. And they're now open to hear what Peter has to say. There were th uh, 
3,000 saved that day on the day of Pentecost. But there were many, many more who heard the same message and did not repent, did not give their life to the Lord. But all these signs, wonders, and miracles were used to produce. And speaking with tongues, they produce an, an openness in all of them, and yet some still rejected and 3,000 accepted. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. So Peter begins his sermon to the Jews first. This is Isaiah 28, verse 11, to the Jew first. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Romans chapter 1 and 16 tells us he went to the Jew first, and he makes a double emphasis that Jesus Though Jesus was 100% God and also 100% man, it was the humanity of Jesus which brought redemption to all mankind. He said in that verse of scripture again, he said that he came a man approved by God among you. So Jesus came as a human being and died for us, brought redemption to all mankind, Jew and Gentile. As deity, Jesus did not have to be approved among men, but as humanity, he did. Besides Jesus' teaching, signs and wonders were God's stamp of approval on the humanity of Jesus. Acts chapter 10, verse 36 through 38, and Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4 tell us that all of these signs and wonders was to put that stamp of approval by God on his humanity that this was truly the Messiah. It was also on the disciples' ministry after the day of Pentecost, the same approval given to Jesus and the same stamp of approval given to Jesus was now on the disciples' ministry to start the Great Commission. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 tell us that signs and wonders are part of the Great Commission. Not only do we go into all the world and preach the gospel, we lay hands on the sick, we cast out devils, and Peter tells these men of the signs and wonders Jesus did, but also reminds them that they know this already. It's inside of them. They know good and well. This is the same stamp of approval that was on Jesus. Verse 23, him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. You actually use the law of man, but you twisted it and perverted it to put an innocent man to death on the cross. But God knew this was coming, planned on it coming, and is using the crucifixion as the means of redeeming all mankind and especially the resurrection of the dead. Jesus didn't come to earth first to heal or perform signs and wonders. He came to this earth to die, Hebrews 2, 9, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. This was the determined, fixed will of God from eternity past. Peter's letting these religious Jews know it was not the Romans who crucified Jesus, but the religious Jews. The Romans carried out the death of Jesus, but the Jews falsified the accusations and was the cause of an innocent man to be put to death. But that innocent man suffered on the cross, went to hell for three days and three nights and took all of man's sickness, disease, and especially his sin and removed it as far as the east is from the west, leaving one thing. Are you going to believe in Jesus or not? Aren't you glad you believed in Jesus? I am. I'm so glad I have. Now is a great time to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. We'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.